Hey everyone, this short video will tell you a little bit about logical fallacies. Now a logical fallacy is any time when someone makes a claim or has a belief of some kind which is illogical or for some reason is not founded or does not flow from the evidence that's available. There are three in particular that we're going to talk about that are relevant to our class and those are the tautological fallacy, the nominal fallacy, and the reification fallacy. Um, so I'll go through each of them in order and give you a couple examples of each and then last we'll talk about why that's relevant to abnormal psychology. So the first one here, the tautological fallacy, or in other words, a tautology, is any time when someone makes a description or a claim that essentially boils down to x equals x, or they're saying the same thing twice, but acting as though that gives some new or novel information. So something along the lines of uh, boys will be boys, or it is what it is. You're saying the same thing twice, but you're sort of alluding to this idea that you've explained something or added some novel info, which really you haven't. So that's logically a problem. I'll give you um, the example here, boys will be boys. Okay, that sort of acts as though it's explaining something about childhood aggression or something that um, might be a part of masculinity, um, but that's just sort of like an assumption that's not founded on any kind of evidence, and it's not in that sentence. Okay, the second one here is the nominal fallacy. What this essentially boils down to is that you're acting as though naming something has explained something. So, to step outside of psychology, for instance, you know, imagine that um, a young child points to a bug and says, you know, what is that and why is it doing that? And the parent says, oh, that's a spider. That doesn't actually explain anything about the animal. It just gives it a label. It gives it a, a name. Um, so to act as though a name fully explains something or gets to the roots of how something works is a bit of a fallacy, right? So if we take that and apply it to abnormal psychology, say for instance that somebody is describing, um, I feel like I'm having a heart attack, I feel like I'm falling apart, I'm, I'm crying, I feel like I might be going crazy, I'm hysterical, and it came on all of a sudden, it sort of just hit me out of the blue that I was extremely anxious. And then someone says, oh, that's called a panic attack. That explains it. Well, not quite. That gives the name for that set of symptoms. We can label it as a panic attack, but that doesn't explain why the person was experiencing those things. So that's illogical to jump to the conclusion that we've uh, figured it out, so to speak. So we could give the example here of something like, that's called a panic attack. Okay, and then the third one in our list here is what's called the reification fallacy. I know it's a bit of a tongue twister, um, but to reify something is to take something that is conceptual or abstract and mistake it for being concrete or real and existent in the tangible world. Uh, there are many things in psychology that we deal with that are conceptual. They're, they're ideas. They don't exist in the way where we could look at them under a microscope or that they could be measured in some physical sense, right? I can't see it with my own eyes, I can't touch it, I can't poke it with a stick, right? It doesn't exist. Um, but they're still important to us. So ideas like all sorts of things, jealousy, sadness, intelligence, a whole host of personality factors, these are all concepts. And, and for the most part, people understand that those don't really exist. The issue with reifying things is that sometimes, particularly in abnormal psychology, um, people make the illogical conclusion that disorders exist in some truly concrete uh, physical way. 
Um, so essentially the idea with the reification fallacy is that it kind of involves these first two issues but takes it a step further in believing that the construct actually exists and has its own causal powers. So let's walk through an example from the personality literature. Um, early in the days of personality research they got interested in this idea that hey some folks like to socialize more than others. It's not too shocking, but it was something where they wanted to find out more about it. In order to study something, we have to have some way of communicating about it. So researchers called that extroversion. And you have probably heard of that before, that some people are extroverted and others are more introverted, right? So they begin doing research on this and they find little qualities and characteristics that seem to be a part of this extroversion construct that we've named. Now all that is fine as long as we don't go too far into saying that naming it has explained why somebody is extroverted. Because it doesn't, right? If, if you like to go to parties, that's not because you're extroverted, right? That's like saying something is green because it's green. Um, calling you extroverted in relation to the fact that you like to socialize is a description for you, right? And that's perfectly appropriate, but we can't really say that that's the cause. Maybe the cause of you liking to socialize has something to do with your genetics or how you were raised, uh, the kind of culture that you grew up in, the kind of experiences you had earlier in, in life that you know taught you that it's positive to go out and to connect with others. Uh, you know, an introversion could be the opposite, right? Maybe folks were more rewarded early in life for spending time alone, for reflecting, making decisions by themselves, and they found alone time more relaxing, right? Neither one of those is right or wrong. They're just descriptions for different ways of behaving. So if we go all the way to making the confusing uh, misstep of reifying it, then we might say something like, oh, Johnny's extroversion caused him to want to go out and visit his friends. Or Sally's introversion caused her to want to stay home on a Friday night. That again makes this mistake of believing that introversion or extroversion are things that exist and are, are tangible in the world, things that I could look at and touch with my fingers, um, when they're not. They're psychological constructs. They are descriptions of things. Why is that relevant to us in abnormal psychology? Well, because many people have the bad habit of reifying disorders. They'll say things like, my depression caused me to have a crying spell. My social anxiety caused me to be fearful of being judged by others. My anorexia caused me to feel terrible about my body image. These things all kind of make sense and they're not necessarily offensive at face level, but they're not logically correct. So. I'll give you the example here of my depression caused me to cry. Okay, your depression did not cause you to cry, but having crying spells might be a part of how one person experiences depression. Or other things like being frustrated, having trouble concentrating, having suicidal ideation. So the important thing is remembering that it's a construct, it's not a concrete existent entity that is in the real world with causal powers.